right now, without wasting any more time, we are happy to have a guy by the name of Paul Rossler on the phones with us. He's in L.A. now in his recording studio taking a break, and he's joining us for an interview. Paul, can you hear us okay? Hey, I can hear you, I can hear you great. How are you guys? Good, man. It's Hi, been, Paul. It's been five years since we've actually seen you, and next month we get to see you again. Can't wait. Looking forward to it. Yeah. What are you in the middle of recording right now, can I ask? Oh, I'm recording a, a very, very interesting prog artist, actually. His name is Fido, P-H-I-D-E-A-U-X. I think I spelled that wrong. <laughs> um, right? I mean, and uh, it's cool. He's just finishing up a, a double concept album, and these prog guys are they're demanding. <laughs> is, it, is it a different type of recording situation than, say, like a regular rock band like I have or whatever? Oh, gosh, yeah. I would uh, think well, so. he's actually been working on this thing for six years, and um, oh, yeah. I'm, I've been doing some vocals for him. It's not, the whole thing hasn't been recorded here. I've just been doing certain things for him, and then we're working on a bunch of new stuff, too. So, um, it's a, like I said, it's a six year. These guys, it's monumental. It's got to be, it's prog. Yeah, for sure, right? There's so many different layers to it. It's a double album, and it's the third of a trilogy. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You're, like, up to your Dude, neck this, in this. <laughs> this guy's awesome. That's cool. You, awesome. You're, you've you you had a, quite the life, man. You know so many, like, really legit uh, artists, like eccentric artists, you know, like really powerful people that write great stuff. What a life you've had, man. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. I've had a, I've had a great life. Of course, I don't, I don't hang with, like, oh, the, the helicopters or flying over um i don't um like i'm the, kanye doesn't call me up to play on his record i don't know <laughs> i'm not playing on like the, the platinum records but i don't think that's really where i belong i think i belong more with like um my people you know yeah it, it's a blessing that kanye's not calling you paul <laughs> well you know i just picked him out of the hat as an example i mean um but i get to work with tsol and you know yeah, and you guys. <laughs> uh, yeah, five years ago, we went down to Paul's studio. It's Kitten Robot Studio in Los Angeles. Um, and, man, what a great experience. My band at the time, um, the Bloody Mess Rock Circus, went in for a few days, recorded on a small budget, and Paul just really did it up for us, man, for what we had to spend and the time. And we were very happy with that record. And one of the songs ended up on a soundtrack in England, so that's cool. Yeah, that was when we were just we had just opened up Kitten Robot, and it was a pretty pretty early on in the process. And we, Rick Agnew came in and helped work on that, and uh, was producing. And I've worked with Rick like ever since. I'm in a band with him called the Jaton de Mon Quartet, uh, GDQ with Jaton, and uh, that's like a really fun project. And and you had Richie Ramone in, and I produced his last album and, and his last single. So uh, that was a great. Great, great contact. I mean, you brought in a bunch of people into my life when you on that in that. Business. Yeah, Rick. Rick Agnew is such a great guy too. He's just a nice, a nice guy. <laughs> he is. <laughs> he's, also, he's also crazy and, and, and I was being awesome. nice, Paul. <laughs> I mean, he's one of my dearest friends. I'll say that. I, I, I'm not going to call him a nice guy. He's too. He's too. Um, passionate and and emotional and talented to be just lumped in the nice guy category well i was trying to be nice yeah rick is <laughs> well, a, i love him I rick mean, is a I lot of things together. super so when, I, when i hopefully i don't sound like i'm uh, stabbing him in the back because it's really quite the opposite we're like brothers it's all recorded <laughs> i know he'll hear it for sure he'll be like what the <laughs> get all emotional <laughs> i do that all the time i know get all emotional punch the wall you won't punch me but um my smash his amp but yeah we play a lot of shows in la it's, it's i really we do a cover of ava braun which is oh. always really fun and uh it's a crazy music man it's uh i should send you some tracks it's like uh it's kind of like nothing else. People say it's the closest thing to being on hallucinogens that you can, you know, do just watching a band, which I thought was a big compliment. Oh, wow. That's uh, interesting. You know, it's Paul. kind of techno-psychedelic. I love that. We it's were a heavy dose of punk rock. <laughs> we were just sitting here talking a few minutes ago before you called, and um, I... I the subject came up, and I'm like, does Paul have, um, has he ever written a book and an and autobiography? Now, I know you released an autobiographical poetry book, right? Um, uh, eight eight wow. Years, yeah, was it did. called? Yeah, it's called Eight Years, and uh, you can find it. Just do a, do a search on the Internet, and uh, 
it's sort of just this one period of my life where things were really, really crazy. Things have really settled down remarkably since those days, but I did kind of document like kind of the darkest, ugliest, craziest era. Right on. Well, have you, is it something you've ever considered of, uh, of actually writing like an autobiography? Uh, it's funny. You're like the second person in two days to say that. Ooh. And, uh, um, I, I do a lot of interviews, and people would be great if people like were to comp them together and put. You know, I feel like how many hats can you really wear? And right now, I'm a I'm a songwriter, and I'm a producer, and I'm a piano player, and you know, musician that plays in bands. And I like respect um, the art of writing. I read a lot of books and stuff, and um, I I don't think I'd be good at it. Well, and that's what he was would saying that. It. He's saying, how would he ever it's find time? <laughs> how yeah, would you find it's time? It's a time-consuming project. I mean, it's something I would tackle with, with help if someone wanted to, you know, but um, to just, uh, I, I, I painted for a while back in the 90s, and then at a certain point I was like, you know, I'm just going to put all my time into music and just see it, see what I can accomplish in this life, you know? Totally. Totally, and I, I know it's something. It is something that I would definitely be interested in reading. But it's funny how what you just said because we were both like, I don't know how Paul would ever find the time to do that. And I'm like, well, that's what you do. You pay somebody else to kind of <laughs> to write it for you, and you and you tell the story, and they they well, kind of write it. Well, you pay me. I mean, I would I would tackle it, but I mean, I to set aside the time just for the sake of you know, but. On the other hand, I give a lot of interviews and I tell a lot of stories, and I, I, I I'm certainly not hard to track down, you know. Um, but uh, that, that's just that's a big project. Maybe when I, if I lose my hearing and I can't make music anymore, that's what I'll do. <laughs> there so you go. you've got a long way to go. So maybe someday, maybe a couple yeah, de I mean, decades it away. To people, it hasn't happened to me yet, thank God. <laughs> you know. So you've done so much stuff musically, and there's two things I wanted to ask you about why they're on my mind. Didn't you go on tour or fill in with the Smashing Pumpkins a few years ago on keyboards, perhaps? Oh, actually, no. It was I was playing with Don Bowles and Nora Keys band, the Fancy Space People, and um, I was playing keyboards in that band, and we opened. We did a tour with them. Okay, you, you was, did a tour with the Pumpkins. Yeah, we did tour with them, but I wasn't playing with... with um, with those guys. Yeah, that was the other side of the Kaleidoscope tour, right? Yeah, yeah, that was, they, they took us out to, I think, just to annoy their fans, <laughs> um, which worked, and, uh, <laughs> and they were trying to annoy their fans anyway, because they were basically playing almost none of the known songs, they were playing all these cool, obscure album tracks, and I have never been a Smashing Pumpkins fan, so I didn't care, but I thought it was interesting, I mean, it was beautiful lighting and beautiful sounds and lots of instrumental long jams and cool stuff but their fans were just like what are you doing and i think having us open for them just fit right in <laughs> what was billy corgan like to work with or hang out with or whatever i mean he was cool you know he liked the band he produced some songs for us and uh he came out in a wig and jammed with us a couple times during the show so he was pretty nice i mean you know, I read stuff that he says, and I'm kind of like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. But um, but on the tour, I mean, I didn't, I didn't see any of that stuff. So he's an outspoken um, guy. Outspoken guy, huh? Yeah, and in some odd ways that I might not necessarily. Do this. But you know what? I I honestly don't study this stuff, and I'm not up on it. I just will read some quick thing as it goes by, and it'll just sound like whoa, total psycho. But I mean, I don't know. You know, <laughs> right. I, I take everything with a grain of salt and. Uh, I, I'm not in his shoes and uh, whatever. Um, I wanted to ask you too. I'm a big, big fan of Nina Hagen. And how long uh -huh. did you, how long did you spend working with Nina? Me too, man. I'm a big fan of hers too. I played with her in her first American band in 1980, and I was played uh, an album, None Sex Monk Rock, and wrote songs for her. I was in that band for about three years, and then I didn't see her for 15 years. And then she found me in 1998, and we played together from. Uh, like 98 till 2000. Wow. So I spent, and then I, I produced, I produced her gospel album, which was really interesting and cool. Um, Cause I didn't really know anything about gospel. And, and then I saw, oh, it's basically rock and roll, except instead of saying, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, they say, Jesus, Jesus, but it's, it's pretty intense music. And, uh, and that record actually did pretty well. It's a really cool record. My concept was, a gospel record, you know, crossed with Tom Waits and Nine Inch Nails, and and I don't know, I, I didn't tell anybody that, but that was that was my idea. Yeah, personal Jesus, right? Yeah, that one. Uh -huh. Yeah, and you you played keyboards and uh, and also produced that as well, right? Yep, 
Yep, and let me tell you, playing gospel keyboards is uh, hmm. uh, uh, it's a challenge. Those yeah, really well. Well, you you brought up the Nun Sex Monk Rock record, which I've had that record since it came out, and I it's always been one of my more like favorite records in my collection. Yeah, it's a it's a wild record, and it's funny because she'd been signed to a major label. I think it was CBS, and that was supposed to be her big debut album, make <laughs> her a star in America. And then she does that, you know, yeah, which is like brilliant. But um, you know, it's 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 more appreciated now, I think, than it was at the time. Just not really a commercial thing for the masses, really, you know. Well, it's it's weird, you know. Nina's not even strictly German; she was East German, so she grew up in the Soviet bloc. Yeah. And culturally that's so so distant from us. We we can't really even imagine. And I think there was a lot of things like she's fascinated with American culture and all that stuff, but she's it's like she's looking at American culture from a, another planet, you know. So, yeah, for sure. So, uh culturally, you know, she's English is probably her I don't know, second or third language. So, um you know, she when she speaks to the German people, it's like they, it's like she's one of them, and, but when she's sort of translated into American, she's very, uh, I don't know, sometimes she's like, she doesn't connect in the same way she does, but man, she's beautiful, she's amazingly talented, and um, I got to work with her enough that I, um, you know, I kind of understand where she's coming from. She's like really a seeker, and she's really, uh, she's a very serious person, you know. She's, she seems... And, you know, she doesn't make her decisions based on what. How am I going to sell a lot of records? She follows her heart. It's really obvious. You can never uh, think that she's ever doing a, some sort of career move. She's really doing, saying what she thinks is important, and I always loved her for that. Well, she seems to be very devotional and really seems to identify with the Hindu Hindu kind of philosophies, which is where I'm at. So I'm really attracted to her music with all the Shiva and just the great the the great devotion she shows through her music. It's great. Yeah. I don't know if there's any other artists that are that into it like she is. I really love it, man. So anyway, wanted to ask you about that. Uh, what's new yeah, with you? Well, what, go what, ahead. I'm sorry. Um, what is new at the studio? What's happening with Kitten Robot? I know you're always busy, but have you been just nonstop busy? I mean, kind of. You know, I'm. I'm. Um, there's uh, just. I just have a lot of artists. That, there's some people that just are kind of regulars and, and are booking the place constantly. You know, my partner is Josie Cotton, and she's working on stuff, so she's in there at least once a week. And then, you know, there's always some... I've got these this word of mouth that just, uh, you know... It's funny, I'll look at the calendar, it's like, oh, nothing up next month. And then at the end of the month, every single day will be filled in, sometimes with a couple people. So, yeah, I'm, like, hard working. What a blessing, man. That's great, Paul. Yeah, thank you. You know, it's like I couldn't have planned it any better. It's like... I didn't really love being on tour, and I really always was kind of skeptical of the whole rock star thing, I guess, because of, um, of punk rock and everything. And what I really love is making music, and it's not really just making my own music, it's just making music in general. So, yeah. I mean, I just, I, I couldn't have planned this. I, I, I wouldn't have thought, like, oh, what I really want is a studio and to record bands all the time. But it's really like the happy life for me. <laughs> it just turns out, you know. Yeah. And now let me ask you this. For those that don't know the early punk rock history of Los Angeles, where on the timeline of things were the germs compared to the screamers? Um, man, I mean, pretty much simultaneous, you know. It's like yeah. things kind of um, – I had a friend who was writing a book about the first four bands in Los Angeles, the first four punk bands, and I believe that he had uh, – the Germs, the Weirdos, the Screamers, and the Zeros. Okay. So they, right from the very beginning, you know, now the, the Screamers sort of, and the Weirdos kind of appeared kind of full-formed, whereas the Germs appeared as um, just four, like, kids causing trouble. And it wasn't until they'd been together a year or two that people started, it started to dawn on people, oh, my God, these guys are actually, have gotten really great, you know? And they did, yeah. So in a way, it sort of <laughs> felt like they almost... I mean, but they were there from the very beginning. I mean, you know. Amazing. We were listening to Screamer stuff earlier. There's just no no other band like the Screamers, you know. It's funny. We had a big a big party for the um, the AIDS life cycle, where they they raise money for AIDS research by riding bikes from San Francisco to Los Angeles. So we have the big party every year for one of the teams, and they were they put on the Screamers and 
there was a the Screamers record and they were playing it and I was listening to it and I was going, Wow, these guys are awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that Paul guy on keyboards is cool. Well, I really <laughs> you know, when I listen, I'm listening because I think when we made those recordings the 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 bootleg recordings that were the four tracks that were recorded in my garage, I think I'd been in the band for like two months or a month or something. So I'm always and I was nineteen years old, so I'm, I'm always like listening, like, am I playing okay? But I'm pretty solid. I've been playing keyboards for a while at that point. But yeah. that's not what you listen to, you know. You listen to Tomato and this whole conception of what that, that band was just one of the best live bands I've ever played in, for sure. It's crazy how the uh, the uh, the image, the Screamers, uh, you know, the whole... Uh, the Gary Panther logo. Yeah, that logo is just like become like this punk kind of. I mean, everyone knows that. You see that, and then it's just you think punk rock. It's like it's just become like a seminal kind of image <laughs> for yeah, for a lot punk of rock. Have no, no idea what it, what where it came from, even or I've never even heard the band. Right, but, um, right. That's cool. It's the the power of um, Gary Panther's. Um, graphics because he i guess he took tomato's head and made that made that uh image and uh yeah it's it's timeless it is timeless so maybe it's of a time i don't know i want the t-shirt <laughs> <laughs> well they're out there I, I, we don't get any money for it i always thought that was interesting that the whatever bootlegs or anything that anybody's ever done nobody in the screamers has ever lifted a finger to try to stop them so it's just a shame i always thought that was really sort of an anarchist art statement there that uh the band had its time it broke up and then and that was it you know? <laughs> and you get nothing after that <laughs> well i got a life you, you got know? a great life yeah man for sure i always try to ask everyone that uh, we have on the show just kind of a general question um if you if you could go back in time say you know however many decades and you weren't in a producer, a musician, if if you weren't involved in music and you had to choose a totally different career, a totally different path, what do you think would be your second second choice other than music? What would you be doing today if you weren't doing what you're doing now? I mean, I got into, I got really seriously into music when I was about 12 years old. Um, before that, I considered, I was, you know, I was interested in biology and I was, th and I was writing a lot of books when I was a little kid. So, Maybe I could have been a writer, or maybe I would have gone into the sciences. I, I don't know. Your dad was um, in the sciences, right? Wasn't your dad? Uh, yeah, well, my dad was my dad was at IBM, and then he was at Yale at the computer center. So um, I might have followed in the, in the um, you know, that was really in the early days. That was like 1969. So in the, if I, I could have gotten into computers, too, although I never, I mean, even though I stare at a computer all day making music on it, I never... My son is a programmer. He's a really great, great programmer. So, um, but I don't know. I, that never really. Uh, Just curious, but, you know. But I used to write a lot of stories, and I was. We, we moved to the Caribbean when I was a kid, and, and we did a lot of scuba diving, and we knew um, a lot of the marine biologists that were down there. So that was a big part of my life growing up. So I often thought I might wind up wind up in that uh, arena somehow. Very there, cool. I actually answered your question. You did. You did answer the question. <laughs> and <laughs> when you were saying, I have a question I ask everybody, I was like, oh, here it goes. <laughs> I'm going to sound dumb now. But a lot um, of people don't think about, like, you know, uh, what what else, you know, the second interest, like, if you're you're so good at what you do, so you don't really give much thought to, like, what would I do if I didn't have this? Or, you know, well, if it kind of goes full circle, because you guys were asking me if I, if I um, was thinking about writing a book, and... Uh, I was. I did think I might be a writer when I was a kid. So, hey, what will happen. there, you there it know. is. <laughs> well, Paul, we are almost out of time. I was going to follow up the interview with some of the music you've played, uh, beginning with something from the Nina Hagen Nun Sex, Sex Monk Rock album. Uh, we'd love to have you back on. You're always an interesting guest, and really looking forward to working with you in person next month. Cool, man. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Yeah, thanks so much, Paul, for taking the time. I know you're extremely busy, but you're you're always uh, somebody we look up to musically and just personally, bro. So thank you. Thank you, Paul. No problem, man. I'll see you guys in a couple weeks. Okay, take care, Paul. We'll see ya. See ya. All right, bye. The great Paul Rossler. What a cool dude, man.